Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Live Stepping Up to Save Bugs. My name is Anne Bollen, and I work for NEMO for, uh, on the Life Nature program, and I will be moderating this morning's sessions. I'm delighted to see that we have uh, over 100 participants with us today from 26 uh, different EU member states, and participants represent different government agencies, NGOs, uh, research institutes, as well as small and medium enterprises. Uh, it's uplifting to see how many of you are interested to step up conservation efforts on invertebrates to reverse their overall declining trends. Our webinar today will last for 90 minutes and we have six excellent speakers lined up for you. The agenda is as follows. Uh, the first two presentations will focus on recent policy developments under the EU Green Deal uh, with a focus uh, on the biodiversity strategies presented by two speakers from DG Environment. Then EASMA will make the link between uh, priorities uh, within the LIFE program on invertebrates and then we'll get feedback from the LIFE program portfolio itself uh, from my colleagues from NEMO and a beneficiary from a LIFE project. After the presentations, we'll have a live question and answer sessions with the different speakers as uh, panelists. And then we go over to conclusions and a final wrap up that ends our webinar. Even if this is a virtual event, we would like to make it as interactive as possible. So I invite you all to use the chat box to write down your question and answers. Feel free to add in your name and organization and who you're addressing the questions to then administrators will publish it or respond directly uh, if possible. And, and I invite everyone to actually vote for the questions, so then they will appear in the order of the questions that generated most interest and will be also responded in that order. Uh, please note that in the chat box on the top right, there is an indication most like. It's best to click that one on so you get them, you get to see them in that order. Uh, we are also recording uh, today's webinar uh, and will provide all of you with the link uh, on the live website so that you can consult the presentations afterwards or share them with uh, perhaps some of your colleagues. So let's get started. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker. We are very pleased to have with us Mr. Umberto Delgado Rosa, who is the head of the Natural Capital unit from DG Environment, and he will give us some insights on several of the ambitious strategies that were recently released under the EU Green Deal. Mr. Delgado Rosa, the screen is yours. Thank you, Anne, and uh, hello to everyone. It's my real pleasure to have the chance to address you some words and to see such huge interest on the important topic of invertebrates. I will get to invertebrates, but I sought to indeed put in context the political uh, situation we have nowadays that relates to biodiversity. And I would start by uh, sharing some thoughts on the meaning of this Green Deal context we have now. Actually, it was even before the Green Deal when the uh, political guidelines of the current president of the European Commission came out there was something different indeed, in the sense by one side there was this um, labeling climate change as an overriding issue, as it is a major problem to be addressed, but there were already there words that linked to climate change, there was another major global problem, which was biodiversity loss. So in a way, both the political guidelines and the Green Deal, in my view, what they do is to highlight two major overriding global environmental problems that are well underpinned by science, that have potentially catastrophic consequences for humankind, but which can also be addressed, there are solutions for them, which are climate change and biodiversity loss. Another angle was that there was some little sentence there in the political guidelines saying that the EU should lead on biodiversity as it has led on climate change in the Paris Agreement. And the EU only leads uh, by example. So this signal that indeed the new policy for biodiversity in the current European Commission was to be more uh, ambitious. 
But before I go into components of the biodiversity strategy, how come this happened? You might remember in the previous European Commission, the priority was all jobs and growth in the wake of the economic, difficult economic context we were living. We were doing the fitness check of the nature, direct, the nature directives. So how come suddenly is it, it's possible to have as a, a major political priority what's called the Green Deal? which is not only about climate and environment, we should concede, it's also an economic agenda, it's also a social agenda, but it's much centered around sustainability. How come? And well, the point I would like to share with you is politics moves largely influenced by public opinion, in particular in democracies, it's influenced by public opinion. And I think the Green Deal was actually a political response to a certain green wave that was out there in the European society. Well, the Eurobarometer for long shows a majority of Europeans attributing a lot of importance to climate and environment, even sometimes an overriding importance in huge proportions, about 90% sometimes. But there was also results of national elections, of local elections, of European elections, the youth movement uh, around climate. So this was a reply to this. But how come this has become so important politically? And here I have my own theory to share with you. Because first, there's the facts. And the fact says the planet is not in a good shape from the point of view of climate and environment at all. Biodiversity included. If, if a civilization from outer space would come and judge us how we manage our planet, we wouldn't have a good mark. So these are the facts. But it's also important to see that the perception of facts tends to coincide with the facts. And I think this comes from the visibility of some signs of degradation of the environment overall and the atmosphere. And that comes from mm, aspects such as, well, extreme weather events that everyone considers a sign of climate change, either they are or not. There's also linked to this, these mega forest fires in many areas of the world from Australia to Europe to Amazon to Siberia. This issue of plastic in the oceans that is not really climate related, but brought, I think, into many minds a strong rejection, an idea that we are encircled by pollution that we create ourselves. And, and I'm here finally getting to invertebrates, insect decline. People usually don't like too much bugs, one can say they are not as charismatic as some vertebrates, but I think people like even less this idea of a circle of pollution, changing how things should be, losing this fundamental ecosystem service that everyone understands, uh, which is pollination, from the layperson to the farmer to the economist, everyone understands that we need pollination. And also a loss, this loss of insects, that many associate with their own health, with food or natural food that they cherish and to a, a vision of a rural farmland that should be as beautiful as they imagine it. So this is to say that suddenly it seems that insects have made a way into politics. And in my view, that's one of the elements explaining why you have a Green Deal and why you have this biodiversity strategy. Now, to go a bit on into the biodiversity strategy, don't fear, I, I won't uh, expose the whole strategy for sure. That's why I also don't have a PowerPoint, but just some comments. I do think very honestly that it's the most ambitious biodiversity strategy that not only Europe, but the world has ever seen. And that comes precisely from the political impulse. What's different now? Well, the main difference is we know the drivers of loss. They were identified by the Intergovernmental Panel of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is London CU's change, overexploitation, climate change, pollution, invasive alien species. So they are, they are all tackled, and they are tackled as far as possible through quantified quantify targets, targets that address sectorial policies, which are the ones that often underlie the loss. And I do think this is a difference. And it does allow the leadership, by example, that the EU should have. Then there, there's also an important element around biodiversity, which is this increasing recognition of the economic consequences of biodiversity loss. 
if you look to the World Economic Forum, which is not the environmental NGOs, it's them saying that it's a major global risk for the economy, the loss of biodiversity. Then the pandemics came in, but surprise, it seems that there's a natural origin in these viruses, not only COVID-19, that hit us. And it seems it's because we mismanage habitats, ecosystems and wildlife. So all this has allowed to come in uh, with a, an ambitious biodiversity strategy. What's in it for invertebrates? How, um, and there are many aspects. I would like to highlight only some. The first is we will have, we are proposing more protected areas, up to 30% of EU, land and sea, of which 10% under strict protection. So protected areas will go hand in hand with providing some shelter and habitats and opportunities for the recovery of invertebrates and insects. Then we aim to have no deterioration of protected habitats and species and bringing 30% of them into a favorable trend of those that are not in a favorable uh, trend nowadays. Many of these habitats will be important for invertebrates, of course. Then we have the whole restoration agenda, bringing this positive message to the biodiversity agenda, of which some, some of the targets, notably those that are common with the farm to fork, are relevant for invertebrates. If we have up to 25% organic farming until 2030, 10% on landscape features, 50% reduction of uh, risk and use and pesticides, and 50% reduction of uh, pollution from fertilizers. All this will be important for recovery. There's also the reverse, the reverse in the decline of pollinators is a specific objective of the biodiversity strategy. And there's also the greening of the cities, which can help a lot giving the trend to, uh, to all this. So if you um, uh, adding to this, you look into the financing opportunities, tapping better from the cap and other uh, EU funds, including life, and also the knowledge needs for the biodiversity strategy. I think this opens way indeed to a new context in which the subject of this webinar is very well framed. So let's just hope that the member states and the parliament will provide their full support to the commission's proposal and maybe we will add to a global deal in 2021 that will make the difference for biodiversity thank you very much over to you one thank you for that excellent introduction on the current eu policy context for both uh, biodiversity in general and invertebrates uh, our next speaker is Mr. Frank Wassen, who is a senior policy officer at the Nature Unit of DG Environment, and he will explain us more in depth what the Biodiversity Strategy 2030 can do for invertebrates. Frank, the screen is yours. Thank you, Anne. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before I build on the presentation by Umberto and I say a bit more about the Biodiversity Strategy, I would like to remind a few words about the e habitats directive. It's, uh, it's a directive that is still, in our view, the main European piece of legislation that in practice contributes to the conservation of invertebrates and biodiversity overall in the European Union. It's a piece of legislation that aims at favorable conservation status for a number of species and habitats of EU importance which are the ones that are listed in its annexes. So it's not really targeting all species and habitats in the, in the European Union, but certain of them. And it has established the biggest worldwide network of protected areas, Natura 2000. It's actually, it's not worldwide, it's a EU wide network, but it's the biggest one globally of protected areas with 28,000 individual sites which nowadays cover 18% of the EU land and 9% of its marine area. So this is a very significant achievement. There is still a lot of progress to be achieved in terms of the management of Natura 2000. And effective management is still not in place for a lot of the sites. There is often a lack of site-specific conservation objectives, of site-specific conservation or restoration measures, and there is also often a lack of capacity financing 
or other uh, limiting factors. A very important element in the implementation of a habitats directive and in any conservation measures overall is the financing. There is significant financing needs for the management and restoration. And we have recently uh, some new updated figures for the financing needs of Natur 2000 and of the hub. Which amount to 15 billion euro per year. Now these financing needs will need to be covered not primarily from life because life is a rather small fund in the EU budget, but from other funds, uh, including the big EU funds like the agricultural and cohesion funds. This is what we call the integration approach of EU funding. Another important element of the directive is the requirement for member states to monitor and report every six years on the status of biodiversity in the European Union. And there is reporting for every species and habitat. Uh, the last report was in 2019 and the EU-wide report, the state of nature report is currently being preferred, prepared and will very soon be made public. But we already know that the overall picture is not too positive and that there is still a lot of species and habitats that are not only in an unfavorable or bad conservation status, but that are even continue to decline further at national or national biogeographical levels. Now, an important element of the habitats directive is that it protects certain specific habitat types. And here you, you see some of them, just an example of the 231 that are covered by the directive. And in fact, it's not only about habitats, it's also about the habitats for certain species. So that's the example that I show on the, on the right bottom corner. This is not the habitat of a directive, not listed in Annex 1, but it's a habitat of a certain species, a butterfly, and as such it is equally protected. So it's more than just the 200. 31 habitats. And what you see here on the pictures are some of the sites, some of the Natura 2000 sites that have been benefiting over the last 25 years from financial support for management or restoration under the LIFE program. And if you would have looked at these sites 25 years ago, they would have looked differently. Some of them would actually not have any habitat because there was just spruce plantations that have been removed in the meantime. So these are examples, some of them of large scale restoration. And when you look at the local context and the result of the life projects, you can see very well that the restoration has led to significant stabilization and sometimes even to an improvement of the populations. So how does it fit together with the overall finding? Well, I think the answer is very simple. We, we do it at a scale that is still much too small. We need to step up the volume of restoration and management. We need to step up the management of Natural 2000. We need improved capacity. We need more financing, of course, and we now know how much we need. We have the, we have the figures. Another important element I, I just want to remind is that what you see here are some of the species that occur in these four, in these four habitat types. So when we talk about habitat restoration, it's always important to keep in mind that habitat restoration is about restoring the habitat for a very large number of species. And in this case, I'm just showing the invertebrates because that's a subject here. It's just a, a small share of the species that occur in these habitats. But I think it is always is a very important reminder that the habitat is not about some theoretical habitat. It's about the the base for the existence of most of the species in the European Union. And that's what the Habitats Directive and the Birds Directive, by the way, are about. Now, of course, it's not all about the Habitats Directive, and we know that it doesn't cover everything. We have, therefore, already quite a while ago, started some additional work, and we have established since 2005 European red lists for certain habitat groups and species groups. And we now have completed them from all the vertebrates, for many groups of invertebrates and for many groups of plant species. So we now have a quite a good overview of the, of the state of biodiversity in Europe, even outside of what is the species covered by the directive. 
And we know that certain species, certain threatened species, clearly do not benefit from the measures under the nature directives. So there is some room to look beyond. Another important piece of work over the last 10 years was the EU pollinator strategy. In the frame of the strategy, some additional red lists have been established, such as the red list for bees, the ones for hoverflies and moths, which are is coming up. And the strategy has also triggered a specific awareness on the particular problem of insect decline in the wider landscape, on the need to do conservation in urban areas. So it's not all about, let's say, the best preserved areas for biodiversity. And the strategy has triggered specific initiatives for pollinators. And I think by the end of, of the day, we will share with you uh, the link to this online platform, EU Pollinator Information Hive, which is basically collecting all these initiatives and which gives you an example of what can be done in the frame of a pollinators strategy. Now I'd like to come back to the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030 and just discuss with you some of the most relevant targets for invertebrates in Europe with a particular view to life because there is more targets that are relevant for invertebrates but perhaps less for life so I'm not going to discuss those that much. I think we have two important targets that are relevant also for practical conservation work by life applicants. The first one is, the, as Umberto mentioned already, the target on protected areas, an extremely ambitious target for enlarging the EU coverage of, by protected areas to 13% of the land and 30% of the sea. So this is much more than what we have for the moment being, although we have already some protected areas under national legislation that must be added to Natura 2000 for the moment being. And clearly that should build on Natura 2000, it will include, but it should be beyond Natura 2000. So that is also important when you think about the question, what should be the areas to be included in that 30%? And clearly there is some work in the next, in the upcoming years for to work on the identification of the most suitable areas for enlargement. And I think some data from the red list from key biodiversity areas and others might have to be taken on board here. Questions such as coherence and connectivity and other issues will certainly come up in the discussions in the coming years. And I would just like to remind that before the end of the year, the Commission will come up with a specific set of criteria on what it considers should be the criteria for enlargement of these protected areas. There is a part of the protected areas target for, for part of for one third actually there is a more ambitious target which is that 10% of the land and 10% of the sea area should be strictly protected in the EU and that would include all remaining primary and old growth forests as a minimum but of course these do not cover 10% and there is clearly more than just these remaining areas that should be uh, covered by strict protection and keep in mind this is not only about biodiversity but also about carbon storage when we talk about those habitats and ecosystems that have a particular capacity for storing carbon. But again, talking about old growth forests, you know there is a huge potential for the conservation of invertebrates and any projects that would help identifying areas or even better contribute to an enlargement of the protected areas network would of course be considered as a priority under the biodiversity strategy. Another important aspect, which is perhaps less sexy, eh? it's the need for effective management. But this is extremely important that, and I mentioned that a lot of sites are currently not yet well managed for a number of reasons. And there is still a lot of work to be done to improve the management effectiveness, including to the establishment of clear conservation objectives and measures to the setup of uh, necessary human resources, financial resources, the monitoring, etc. So this is all a work stream for the coming years as well, where this is not yet fully achieved. The second important point on the biodiversity strategy is the EU nature restoration plan. Umberto already mentioned the target of 30% of species and habitats 
not currently in favor of conservation status that should show positive trends by 2030. We would expect the member states to come up with very clear objectives in terms of and even commitments in terms of saying what are the species and habitats that should be the object of improvement measures so that such improvements could be measured by 2030 and clearly projects that would be linked to those commitments would also be considered as a priority for funding. In addition, there are some specific targets for restoration on agricultural land and on rivers. Uh, so the strategy talks about 25,000 kilometers to become restored so that they are free flowing. And for agricultural land, 10% of the agricultural land should be covered by landscape features for which life certainly also has some role to play. Also, although when we talk about the landscape features, clearly this is a good example of where the integration approach should prime. This is something to be covered primarily by the CAP funding. But preparing the, the ground for this, I think there is a huge opportunity under life, including for the integrated projects to work on the more strategic level on how to make this happen. A last important point specifically for the pollinators is that there is a clear objective under the under the biodiversity strategy to have pollinators decline reversed and there obviously we also see a lot of room there and just to remind you that we will very soon have uh, the red list for hoverflies we already have the red list for bees some other pollinators are in other species groups for which we already have the red list as well so clearly there, there is a, an opportunity to, to work on the most threatened pollinator species in particular, but also perhaps to strengthen the work uh, on green infrastructure, on rural areas, etc. So I think my time is over. I thank you very much for your attention and I pass the floor back to Anne. Thank you very much, Frank, for highlighting these different opportunities related to uh, different targets in, in these strategies. Uh, this is very useful uh, for our participants. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Angelo Salsi, who is the head of the Life and Eco Innovation Unit and, at EASMA. And we are uh, happy to have you with us uh, here today, Mr. Salsi. And uh, I understand you will provide us more background on the importance of invertebrates within the LIFE program, not just for this upcoming call LIFE 20, but also in the next uh, multi-annual uh, framework. Mr. Angelo, the floor is yours. Thanks, Anne, and uh, thanks to Umberto and Frank for this uh, very nice framing of, uh, of the discussion in the, in the policy arena, showing that indeed LIFE uh, is a program which is perfectly fit for, uh, for the purpose of supporting policy implementation. Now, I start with a question uh, that uh, I'm not waiting that obviously everyone in the webinar will we'll start replying to, but the question is the following, which I asked to myself as well. Are we conservationists doing enough for our bags? So obviously we can uh, we, we can discount all that is not done by the agricultural sector, by many other areas, but uh, the question is really for us. And uh, if I take life as a sort of a uh, representative uh, uh, window of the reality, meaning uh, how much conservation world is taking care of this particular part of the biodiversity, uh, then the reply is probably not. Uh, I mean, I'm not pretending that life is everything which is happening across Europe today in terms of conservation, but is indeed quite a representative slice. And uh, we're talking about uh, in 28 years, uh, roughly a bit less than 200 projects that have uh, either as direct or indirect uh, impact uh, on, uh, on some insect or invertebrate species, which frankly I don't find it enough compared to the challenge that we were faced with. Then somebody could argue, rightly so, that maybe since life has always been the, the nature part of life hooked uh, one to one with the habitats uh, directive. Uh, the habitats directive annexes are maybe too short in terms of uh, certain species that could be there and should be there, but they are not. Uh, well, okay, we have opened uh, some eight years ago the possibility of complementing, if you want, the shortness, if we can say so, of these annexes of the habitats directive with the red list species. 
And so far, the use of this particular feature of life has been very, very shy, if I can say so. We count on the on the finger of uh, one or two hands the number of projects that had used uh, this particular possibility. Now the question comes uh, uh, to the why. Why is this happening? Uh, we have uh, come with possibilities to in the past to confront ourselves uh, with uh, various actors uh, that are obviously much better placed than me to judge uh, why this particular mechanism uh, the, doesn't lead to more action on the field uh, in terms of protection of, uh, of invertebrates. And it seems that one of the, f the elements that comes again and again is that there is a problem of disconnection between research and practitioners. And, uh, and the, when, when something happens, uh, like in a moment in time or in space, uh, a, research, uh, a researcher meets the practitioners, so, so say an NGO meets uh, an institute of a university, and they start talking about a specific species need, uh, like uh, an orthoptera instead of another, another family, uh, then all of a sudden uh, the, the project comes alive. And when I mean the project, I mean real action on the field. Uh, so then the knowledge comes into the, into the practitioner's world uh, and, the, uh, and the practitioners, they have the mechanism and the, the ability to put together the project, to ask for financing uh, and to carry out the actions on the, on the field. Uh, the, so this is the, if you want, the scenario. Uh, what are we currently doing uh, to enhance the ability of, uh, of the people out there or to stimulate their interest, for example, in the case of life, uh, to use the life vehicle uh, to promote uh, more projects that are dealing with, uh, with invertebrates? Well, first, we have built, I think, a very solid narrative in all our calls and in all our sessions uh, of information, uh, in our platform meetings, and we keep saying it again and again and again. And indeed, in some cases, we had some, some results, like for example, the most recent wave on pollinator connected to the new uh, strategies on pollinators gave rise indeed to a certain number of projects that were not only proposals, but they turned into projects so they were financed. So it shows that indeed when you meet the the right people in the right moment, uh, we, you, you can probably alter the course of, uh, of things. We are developing, and this webinar is part of this uh, logic of the strategy, we are developing a, a series of uh, uh, elements like events or participation to events or info session dedicated uh, uh, where we show our face as life managers and we tell the people who are in that room, whether virtual or real, uh, about life and the possibility that life can uh, can provide them. And we're doing it in a more targeted way. We have also opened uh, new facilities in the call uh, 2020, but they will continue later on. Uh, the first one is what we call the small grant scheme. So it's a scheme whereby we give a subvention, so a grant to one of our beneficiaries or so to your project, let's say, and in turn, you can use part of that money to give small grants, small subventions to local initiatives. Obviously, in the field of nature conservation and biodiversity, this is very much uh, welcome uh, because there is a, a lot that is happening at very local level, carried out by very small groups that will not be able to participate in full in a live project and, and be, let's say, subjugated uh, under the administrative burdens that we impose but they can indeed provide a significant help through very small local initiatives. We're talking about uh, uh, something in the area of 10, 20,000 euros per, per small grant and up to 100,000 euros uh, during the time of the project. We have opened again after 1998 when we closed it, uh, uh, the possibility to give a value to volunteers work. So the volunteers that will be working in a structured way in a life project in the future they can be given a value in euro per day, and this obviously has, could have a major impact on reducing the need for matching funds. So this is, and in the case of invertebrates, again, if you take, for example, Lepidoptera, it's one of the classical areas, we have tons of volunteers that are indeed dev devoting much of their time, but this time has no value so far. And finally, we, uh, we, we keep saying that obviously there is a mismatch between research and, uh, 
and uh, and practical implementation on uh, on the field. And uh, we are now trying to do thanks to a, a very nice and uh, and uh, positive evolution of the discussion we started with the biodiverse network. Uh, we are start starting to try to see with, between biodiverse and life uh, what kind of synergies and complementary use of these uh, two mechanisms uh, we, we can find. And indeed, in the case of invertebrates, it's not only a question of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, missing uh, activity on the field. A lot of times it's a question of missing knowledge. There is one of the questions in the question and answer time you will see uh, dealing indeed about unknown status of species. <laughs> so that's one of the areas where we have to invest a bit of money. I think I'll, I'll leave you with uh, with that. So a sort of a, a negative start in in my in my presentation and and possibly a positive uh, end, uh, inviting people to consider again and again and to pass on the word to those that they meet on the road. Uh, biodiversity is made up by more than 80% by these species that we don't even see. And uh, when we talk about ecosystem services, they all start with this kind of species. It's, uh, and uh, I have nothing against continuing financing, obviously, projects on projects on flag species, uh, but uh, we have to take care also of this uh, less visible part of biodiversity and a more consistent and continuous way uh, using life and possibly all the other means that we have available. Thank you very much. On to you. Thank you, Angelo, for uh, these uh, useful insights, which will no doubt have inspired many of the participants to apply for, for life funding, we hope. Um, to learn even more about the LIFE program and invertebrates, uh, I would like to introduce our next speakers, uh, John Houston and Maria Jose Aramburu, who are my colleagues from NEMO, and they will present the findings from an ex post evaluation of different LIFE projects on invertebrates. Over to you, John. Uh, well, good morning, everybody, and thanks very much to Anne. In this presentation, Maria Jose and I will we'll outline the findings of an ex post study of 20 life projects, a review of project experience. The study is a step in the process which began with a meeting of experts in 2011 to discuss how the life programme could better meet the needs of invertebrates. The immediate outcomes were the publication Life and Invertebrate Conservation and the opening up of the programme to projects addressing European red list species. A follow-up platform meeting was held in 2018, hosted by the Scottish project EcoCo Life, with 27 projects represented and publication of recommendations to policymakers. This in turn led to the study of 20 closed projects, which either targeted Annex 2 invertebrate species or were habitat projects with key actions for invertebrates. I'll just explain why we do this. When you are delivering project actions, the focus is on quantitative outputs, hectares restored, populations recovered, and so forth. By the end of the project and in the afterlife plan, there's the intention that your outcomes, such as rolling out new management measures, will continue to develop. And the only real way to assess this longer term impact is to revisit the project after five or 10 years. This is what we call an ex post study. And in this case, our colleagues from the NEMO regional teams visited the project and we've compiled a summary report, which is now published. I'll start by giving you some of our headline findings. And in the second part, Maria Jose will present our conclusions and recommendations. So what did we learn? Well, species led and habitat led projects can achieve similar results. But there were several examples in species projects where even where the habitats improved, it does not necessarily lead to increased populations of the target species. For many species, habitat connectivity is needed. This is especially true for the many butterfly species where patches and corridor approaches are shown to be effective. Farmers, foresters and river managers were generally supportive and the public interest has been increased. And some of the best projects show good examples of science informing management and management providing a basis for policy to ensure continuity of conservation measures. And turning now to some of the common issues we've found, perhaps the greatest threat all round 
is the speed and scale of landscape change and land use change. Most projects can only develop conservation measures on relatively small areas and outcomes must be scaled up to have a significant effect. There's clear evidence that the threats to invertebrate biodiversity from agricultural practice are growing. River management and water pollution are also significant threats to, to aquatic invertebrates. There are difficulties in maintaining monitoring work. The main reasons are lack of funding, especially after the project, the scarcity of experts, especially in Southern Europe, and year to year fluctuations in weather. Most invertebrate populations will fluctuate in response to weather. Long data runs, such as the example here for the larval webs of the scarce fertility over 15 years, highlight what might be considered natural fluctuations. This creates a problem for the much shorter time span of a life project and partly explains why getting the habitat right is not always matched by increasing populations. Difference in, differences in recording methodologies can make it difficult to compare data. Some species are very mobile, so a population may cover a large area, whereas other species have very poor rates of dispersal, so every location may be described as a population. Many projects would like to carry out further studies, but are confused about the eligibility of research. Given the large numbers of Annex II species, where the conservation status is unknown, there may be a good case to be made for more research. Although only a few species, less than 1% of, of Europe's invertebrates are actually listed in the Habitats Directive, this nevertheless shows that invertebrates have as much need for protection as other species. The LIFE programme has supported projects for about 65 Annex II species, although some of these, such as the marsh fertility, are no longer considered threatened by the IECN, the overall improvement to the habitats will benefit many other species. It can also be the case that other species, including IUCN threatened species, may prove to be better indicators of habitat quality than some Annex II species. This is not particularly, this is not a problem where monitoring is covering a range of species. The results of the study also agree with IUCN experts who highlight the threats to invertebrates, which are particularly severe in Southern and Eastern Europe. These threats include habitat loss, climate change and pollution. Although forest fires have always occurred, the increase and frequency and intensity of wildfires is posing a particular threat to invertebrates. Since the capacity of recovery of vegetation and soils has been compromised. The decrease in rainfall and the lengthening drought periods may exceed the capacity of species to withstand these events. I'll finish by saying that although the life projects are small in output, they are big in ambition. They can develop and test new solutions and they can create the conditions for gearing up their experience at national and European level. Maria Jose will now outline some of the recommendations and ideas coming out of the work of both the platform meeting and of the ex post study. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for attending this webinar. I'm going to present main conclusions of the survey and some recommendations. As pointed out by John, Many invertebrate species are linked to agricultural land and then invertebrate considerations should be taken into account when applying agri-environment schemes or other kind of mechanisms. Throughout all the project analysis, we saw that short-term actions are being insufficient to deal with the threats currently affecting invertebrates and a wider strategic view should be necessary. There is a need of more joined up thinking to address the urgency of the threats. Additionally, it was detected that some Natura 2000 sites, for example, in Greece and Malta, they do not actually hold suitable areas for invertebrates as a result of climate, climate change impact and habitat loss. This is a real threat for some of species that currently have restricted distribution range 
so, so, such as the one that you may see in the picture, Iberus walterianus, which is an endangered species only found in a small area at the southeast of Spain. Generally speaking, invertebrates are overlooked or not appreciated. It is necessary a major effort on communicating the essential role of invertebrates at all levels. I would like to remark at all levels because this lack of awareness is not only applicable to general public, but also to other sectors like public authorities or landowners. We should be able to transmit the relevance of invertebrates for both nature and human beings in crucial processes such as creating organic soil matter, decomposing forests that good, supporting grassland and wetland ecosystems, or pollinating wildflowers and crops. Also in this line, there are examples of good practices and su successful initiatives on invertebrate-friendly land management that could be applied elsewhere, but unfortunately they are not being sufficiently promoted. To be effective, guidance to landowners should be tailored to local circumstances. There are tools and knowledge available for doing it, so we must go for it. Finally, turning to a different issue, invertebrate specialists often belong to small organizations or to research centers with limited budget. and conclusions of both the platform meeting of 2018 and the exposed survey, we all outlined a set of recommendations and suggestions at the European level and at life program level. Among the first ones, the implementation of initiatives for invertebrates should be clearly boosted. Species action plans, such as the action plan for the Danube clouded yellow butterfly or habitat action plans or the pollinators initiative all of them should be widely developed. And new action plans for a species should be also promoted since they are currently very scarce. In this respect, it was deemed highly relevant to take a broader perspective, considering the different biogeographical -geogra regions to define and prioritize actions. As previously mentioned, a definite action should be taken at European level to mainstream invertebrate needs in other policies in order to ensure that, for example, forest and agricultural management are not being detrimental for invertebrates, or that ecological requirements of aquatic invertebrates are taken into consideration for river basin management and water quality. And this should be firstly done at European level. Following with the idea of putting invertebrates at the forefront of conservation, the prioritized action framework for Natura 2000 of the member states should include the specific actions for invertebrates. Regarding the life program, if we want to see higher number of projects dealing with invertebrates, it is necessary to tailor the call for proposals for attracting higher number of applicants and also to better define project requirements according to invertebrate needs and to overcome the gaps detected. Among the suggestions with the same, we would like to emphasize the following. Projects should be fully focused on invertebrates, particularly on endangered species, functional groups such as pollinators, habitat quality for species, and habitat connectivity. It was detected that when invertebrates are secondarily targeted, they are usually forgotten and measures for invertebrates are only partially or even not implemented. Increasing the European Union co-financing rate for projects really focused on invertebrates would be a very good, very effective measure for giving impulse to applications, given that budget shortcomings and the high co-financing rate are main reasons discouraging applicants. This measure could be complementary to other ones already in place, given, like giving higher scores to invertebrate projects during the evaluation process. In the survey, it was noticed that different 
differences in monitoring methodologies led to examples where data were not comparable or cases in which the lack of sound monitoring made virtually impossible to assess the effectiveness of project actions. Then a monitoring methodology according to scientific international standards should be a requirement for project proposals. This would allow to compare the outcomes of the project with other data at national and European level and to provide information for reporting into Article 17 of the Habitats Directive. On the other side, the lack of experts on different invertebrate species has been highlighted as a relevant problem. Then the active promotion of collaboration with universities to train new specialists within the framework of a live project could contribute to fill this gap. It would be advisable that invertebrate projects would include the development of citizen science networks as it has been demonstrated to be a good tool for getting valuable data and to engage people as well. To be useful, citizen science schemes should be managed by any reputed institution committing to maintain it in the long term. Another interesting option could be promote projects under other life strands different than nature and biodiversity that might include actions benefiting invertebrates for example, regarding soil conservation or water quality. The scale of the problem we are facing with the decline in essential invertebrates and the area affected requires strategic solutions, such as scaling up for, from traditional life projects to integrated projects. This option would allow the development of projects targeting invertebrates at a broader scale with an extended timeline and involving the competent authorities of member states. An example, sorry, an example of this strategic is the integrated project for Forest and Farmland, which stated, started in January 2020 and will run until December 2029. The main objective of this project is to develop an adaptive and community-based management of forest and farming landscapes to improve the conservation status of Natura 2000 habitats and species. This project comprises a set of measures for invertebrates, such as restoring semi-natural grassland habitats, assessing the effectiveness of agroenvironmental schemes for biodiversity, or developing and implementing an action plan for pollinators. And no less important, Another objective is changing the negative perception of key stakeholders about protected areas, which are currently seen as something restrictive. I don't want to finish without giving some tips to those ones that are thinking to apply for life, but I'm not extending too much on it. I would especially stress the relevance of counting with invertebrate experts since the very beginning of project planning and during the project implementation in order to ensure the suitability of the actions and the robustness of the methodology and monitoring. Also, you may consider an extended project duration if you deem it necessary. Traditional projects are lasting four or five years, but you could present a longer project if it's duly justified. It would be desirable that your project includes measures to involve, to involve key stakeholders from the start with tailored communication measures. You must be able to transmit them the importance of the ecosystem services provided by invertebrates and their relevance for human beings. And finally, third party grants uh, is a new option included in the current life call, which could be very interesting to bring on board small organizations. On the one hand, now we have the European Commission and on the other hand, the applicants. And we all can work together for improving the status of invertebrates in the European Union. You can find more information on the live call in the following links before, below. So thank you very much to you all for your attention. And I give the floor back to Anne. Thank you, John and Maria Jose, for sharing these useful recommendations for future applicants. And then last but not least, I would like to invite Craig Makadam, um, who is um, 
working for the NGO Bug Life uh, in Scotland, and he will share uh, experience from his life project Ecoco Life, and also from the point of view how it is being an associated beneficiary uh, as a small NGO. Mr. Makadam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anne. Uh, good morning, I'm Craig McAdam, Conservation Director with Bug Life. Today, I'm going to discuss our involvement as an NGO with Life Projects. I'm going to share with you some information on the Ikoko Life Project that we've just that's just completed, and also explore some of the pros and cons of working uh, on Life Projects as an NGO. But first, let me just tell you a little bit about Bug Life. Bug Life is the only organisation in Europe concerned with the conservation of all invertebrates, from sp spiders to starfish, mollusks to mayflies. Our aim is to halt invertebrate extinctions and achieve sustainable populations of invertebrates. We're based in the UK, but we've worked across the world, including Tanzania, Sri Lanka, South Georgia, St Helena and of course Europe. We're a small charity, currently with 26 members of staff and a turnover of around 1.5 million euros per year. Most of our funding is derived from project work, although we also encourage membership and we have received some legacies in the past. We seek to achieve our aim through a number of activities. We inspire others by introducing them to the world of invertebrates around them. We undertake practical conservation activities such as bog restoration and the creation of wildflower areas for pollinators. We shape policy through advocacy efforts and the development of position papers and strategies. Uh, and we raise awareness through walks, talks, workshops and media stories. Our current campaign is called No Insect Tinction, which is our blueprint for solving the insect declines crisis. We've identified actions around, under three broad themes, making room for insects to thrive, creating safe spaces for insects and building a friendlier relationship with insects. And there's lots more about this campaign on our website. So what I'm going to talk to you uh, about today is our involvement in the Coco Life Project, um, which ran from September 2014 to August 2018. It implemented a series of practical measures across central Scotland aimed at improving ecological coherence of habitats. The coordinating beneficiary was Scottish Natural Heritage, the statutory nature conservation agency for Scotland, and associated beneficiaries were the Scottish Environment Protection Agency and five NGOs, RSPB Scotland, Scottish Wildlife Trust, Butterfly Conservation, East Ayrshire, Coalfield Environment Trust and Bug Life. The aim of the project was the implementation of integrated habitat networks to improve ecological coherence across the Central Scotland Green Network area, this area in pink on the map. Um, Bug Life was involved in a number of separate elements of this project. The one I'd like to talk to you about just now is on peatlands on the Slamanan Plateau, which is an area between Edinburgh and Glasgow. This is the project site, a 210 hectare lowland raised bog called Fannyside Muir which is located near Cumbernauld, slap bang in the middle between Edinburgh and Glasgow. The site has historically been mined for peat and further damaged by planting of con uh, commercial coniferous forests. The aim of the project was to restore the bog and bring back favourable conditions for the invertebrates that live there. To do this, we used several different interventions. Over 4,300 dams were installed in drainage ditches to retain water in the bog now allow recovery of peat forming sphagnum mosses and each one of these red and green dots is a dam that we installed in, uh, on this site. Over 30 hectares of conifers and 54 hectares of birch scrub and gorse were also removed to prevent damage to the bog surface which contributes to its drying out. This is a typical ditch in the bog before restoration. It's deep and in wet weather water flows down here taking it away from the peat that requires it. This is one of the dams that was installed. This is a, a sheet piling dam that is then reinforced braced with wooden stakes behind it. And this is the result. The water is held back and over time will occlude with sphagnum moss regrowth. And almost immediately behind the diggers, we saw black dart dragonflies laying their eggs into these pools that were forming. So it was an immediate effect. For 26 hectares of the driest and most degraded parts of Fannyside Muir, uh, we used a technique called cell bunding, and that's where we dig a deep trench into the peat on four sides. The excavated peat is then compressed into the trench, leaving a bun slightly higher than the surface of the bog, which creates a 20 by 20 metre cell. This cell blocks small ditches and cracks in the peat, which disrupts subsurface water flow and forms a shallow pool on the surface of the bog. And that's quickly colonised by cotton grass and later sphagnum. 
And the result, as you can see from this drone image, is absolutely incredible. Dragonflies and wading birds colonise these pools almost immediately. And the bugs absolutely love it. We've recorded over 500 invertebrate species using the bog, um, 33 species of bees, 86 species of true flies, 82 beetles, uh, beetle species, and 79 butterflies and moths species. The dragonfly fauna is particularly good for central Scotland with nine species present. And these species are providing a whole range of essential ecosystem services, such as pollination and water purification and so on. And they just demonstrate how healthy the bog is now. In addition to the bog work, we also worked on um, a, a series of measures to benefit a wide range of pollinators. As we've heard, pollinators are in decline across Europe for a variety of reasons, not least the loss of flower rich habitats. In the UK, there's been a 97% loss of flower rich meadows since the 1930s. And our work in the Ecopo Life Project was aimed at identifying where meadow recreation could take place to create a habitat net that, network that would give the most benefit for pollinators. To do this, we used a method uh, called beelines, which we've been developing for a number of years. First of all, we identify the current coverage of beneficial habitats. Um, these are habitats where pollinators are readily found, already found, such as existing flower-rich grasslands, brownfield sites, heathland and deciduous woodland. Um, we then look at how easy it is for these pollinators to move between the existing patches of good habitat. We assign a value to every habitat in the study area on the basis of how easy it is for a pollinator to move through them. For example, heathland would be very easy for a pollinator to move through, but a conifer, coniferous forest would be quite difficult. And the model mimics a, an electrical circuit looking for the paths of least resistance between these existing patches of good habitat. At the end of this process, the best routes for joining up existing habitats are selected. But before finalising the lines, we speak to local people to make sure that they all make sense in a local context. So what does it look like in Central Scotland? Well, here are the beelines that we mapped in Central Scotland as part of the Ecopo Life Project. They stretch from coast to coast and cut straight through the middle of the country. All the beelines are three kilometres wide and we've calculated that around 10% of the area covered by these lines needs to be filled with flower rich habitats to make a functional network, to make it ecologically coherent. You can see that we've also mapped beelines for the whole of England, Wales and Northern Ireland and the work in Scotland made possible by the life funding has led to further mapping in the south of Scotland and the Highlands. And we hope to have a complete network map for the UK by the end of the summer. Having the network has allowed Bug Life and others to focus habitat creation work. And this map I've just put up here, you can see that already only a year after the end of the Ecopo Life Project, we have habitat creation work happening all across central Scotland focused on these beelines. And this is what it looks like in practice. This was a uh, uh, this was a piece of amenity grassland, very short, uh, close cut grassland in the in the centre of a town, um, a large area um, with very little biodiversity value. Now it has a, a flower rich grassland that we created here in Bowness during the life project. This was the first year where we had a huge burst of colour from the annual plants, and in the second year and subsequent years, the perennial plants started to bloom. Uh, and as I said before this, this was effectively an ecological desert. It was just close cut uh, grass. But now it's home to an array of pollinators and it buzz absolutely buzzes with life all through the summer. One of the questions when I was asked to give this talk was to consider what the benefits were as an NGO in being involved with a life project. One of the big benefits is that we're able to dream big. Um, the, the level of funding available through life projects mean that we can be ambitious, however, the requirement for match funding can be problematic. Uh, as the availability of other funds dries up, it means that there are significant challenges in finding the, the match funding that's required for big projects. Uh, that's particularly problematic for small NGOs which don't have dedicated fundraising teams, but it was good to hear the possibility now to include volunteer time as match funding because we couldn't, we really couldn't have done these life projects without the volunteers that came out and, and ripped up um, scrub out of bogs and helped put in ditches and things. Another big benefit is that every life project could be achieving a whole load, lots for invertebrates, not just those projects focused on individual species. For example, our work on Slamanan Plateau was primarily a peatland restoration project. However, it benefited this huge number of invertebrate species. 
Invertebrates often seem to be overlooked though, or added in as an afterthought. Uh, but if you consider them at the planning stage of projects, you could achieve a lot, lot more for them. The inclusion of red list species as qualifying species for projects is really welcome. It allows targeting of action for species most at risk and will, I'm sure, bring some species right back from the brink of extinction. As Frank explained, there are efforts to red list more species. However, we need to make sure there's a continued programme of red listing with sufficient funding to allow invertebrate groups to be assessed across a wide range of habitats. And there's only, for instance, there's only one group of, uh, of invertebrates, mollusks, that have been assessed in freshwater. We need to be looking at a much wider range of, of species. Finally, life projects represent an opportunity to raise the profile not only of our organisation, but also of invertebrates as a whole. It was, it was a really great privilege to be involved with the invertebrate platform meeting as part of the Coco Life project, and it's great to see so many people here at this webinar. So would we consider being part of a life project again? Well, yes, but we're too small to lead a project. We'd always need to fit invertebrates into other people's plans. As, as a small organisation, the administrative burden is considerable, even as an uh, associate beneficiary. Um, so we need to work out how to streamline that process for ourselves. We need to be able to achieve full cost recovery, full recovery of our costs and overheads. Um, for example, the Ecoco Life Project could only pay 7% overheads, but our overheads at the time were closer to about 10%, which meant that we had to find additional match, match funding to cover those costs or underwrite those costs from our financial reserves. Another issue with overheads is that they're paid retrospectively, and we've only just received in the last couple of months our final payment uh, for the Cocoa Life Project overheads, which was which finished 14 months ago, and that could be a big problem for small organisations with limited cash flow. Um, due to the complexity, life projects generally have a long lead-in time, and we started working on the development of the Cocoa Life Project in 2012-13. And this development time, uh, this development work is unfunded. So we, we need to put a lot of our own time into a project long before any work on the ground happens. And projects are typically around four years long, which is often too short a period to see real success, real recovery of a species often takes a lot longer than four years. And that's why post project monitoring, I think is really essential. I'd like to suggest that some funding is included in projects to allow monitoring of interventions after say 10 years and I'll finish by just I'll just finish by giving you an example of this. Freshwater power mussels are globally endangered and critically endangered in Europe. They are listed on Annex 2 of the Habitats Directive. Unlike most invertebrates, they are very long lived, with the oldest individuals reaching um, in excess of 100 years old. They take between 10 and 15 years to reach maturity, which means that they need favourable conditions such as good habitat good water quality and a host fish population to be present continuously over that time. Many populations in the UK are, are now functionally extinct. That, that is, they are no longer breeding due to problems with their habitat or water quality or the loss of the host fish population. The Pearls and Peril project was a life funded project that ran for four years from 2012 to 2016. We weren't involved in this, but we fully supported all the actions that were happening through it. The project delivered interventions in 21 river catchments across the UK. It undertook a wide range of activities such as habitat improvements, including removing artificial in-stream features and installing woody debris, reducing nutrient and sediment inputs through creation of buffer strips, making improvements to river banks and planting native trees along their banks. So was it a success? Well, undoubtedly, yes, it did a huge amount of work for pearl mussel populations. But when will we actually see if it has actually uh, helped the mussels? It's such a long time to maturity means that we may not know if these populations are no longer functionally extinct for some time. These populations will need to be monitored to see that the recovery is progressing, and if not, further interventions may be required. And whilst this may be an extreme example, the same circumstances apply for habitats such as ancient woodland where sapless islet and beetles live, and the process of decay takes place over many, many years. I hope that has given you a flavour of what it's like to work on a, a life project with an NGO. Uh, um, I'd like to thank you for listening and I'll hand you back to Anne.
Thank you very much, Craig, uh, for that presentation full of positive and inspiring messages. So this uh, includes our presentations. I see the participants have already posted lots of questions. Even if some have been answered, we'll still go through the most uh, popular ones. Uh, so I would like to invite the panelists to activate their video and unmute their microphones. And I also welcome uh, Manuel Montero Ramirez, who is a policy advisor from EASMA with also lots of experience on live uh, invertebrates projects. Uh, so let's get started. A uh, first question uh, talks about the link between invertebrate conservation and farming options and that often sustainable farming and biodiversity concerns are under supported and that there's obviously a very strong lobby from the agriculture sector. Uh, is there a strategy to overcome this problem? I suggest this question goes to Frank. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I mean, this is clearly uh, an issue that has been dealt with both in the biodiversity strategy and in farm to fork, where there is a number of uh, objectives or targets that have been specified specifically for agricultural land. One is the and target for landscape features. There is another one that is very important. Uh, it's about, I didn't mention it, but it's important. It's about reducing the impact of pesticides either to quantitative reduction or reduction of the let's say the negative impacts of certain pesticides so this will be an important work stream in the coming years and of course uh, a very important part of actions on agricultural land is linked to the funding and in particular uh, the second pillar uh, agri-environmental measures but also uh, under the first pillar increasingly. And uh, this will also be certainly uh, part of also the negotiations that are currently starting uh, at uh, the commission level with the member states. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. So next is a, a comment from Susanna in Portugal and she's making a strong case to not forget the soil dwelling uh, arthropods uh, and the soil invertebrates as a whole given their very important role in soil fertility and uh, agricultural systems so fully agree with you Susanna let's not only talk about the the bees and the, and the butterflies but think about those uh, invertebrates uh, next question uh, I suggest is for uh, Angelo. Uh, so basically Croatia as a new member state has just recently started doing assessments according to Article 17 and most of the insect species have an unknown status. So they understand the Krizimir uh, understands that they cannot submit an application under the LIFE program. Uh, would you have any suggestions how to, to tackle this? Well, the two options, either you push Croatia to do the homework, uh, which is probably the, the, the preferred one, but it will take a bit of time. Uh, and uh, I have I have a bit of sympathy, obviously, for the Croatian authorities because uh, filling in the gap of knowledge on, uh, on invertebrates is not a, an easy piece of cake. Uh, but still, on some of them, uh, I think it would, uh, it would be possible. The other way around is that uh, uh, you use uh, a, a proxy if you want to get to uh, the conservation of, uh, of what you intend to, to, put, to protect indeed as your final uh, target, as Craig well explained in his project, uh, bogs uh, were used uh, uh, to a certain extent as a proxy for that. So uh, you get a lot more by simply designing your project with having in mind obviously your bogs in the case of Craig's project, uh, but designing the action in a way that you can capture all the uh, the, the, the positives uh, for the insects or uh, invertebrates in general that uh, that you want to, to protect. So in this way you get around if you want this restriction that we have imposed uh, in the in the live call and uh, I hope this might be enough but Frank probably has even another idea. Well yes it's an idea but keep in mind that for most of the invertebrate species listed in the annexes we also have the European red lists. So a species that is considered as threatened or worse mm -hmm. in the European red lists uh, would, even if it is uh, under, let's say, considered unknown in the Article 17 assessment of the member state, 
is probably a, a likely candidate for priority for funding on the life. Smart guy. <laughs> another also another comment also to explore the horizon 2020 because for many of them we will might need also some basis research and so on so funding might be also available there okay thank you all uh, next question from claudio so he says when we speak of decline of pollinator invertebrates the focus is very often on the bees the honeybees but in some context this species competes with indigenous wild uh, pollinators um, he says many protected areas promote beekeeping and organic honey production within their areas, sometimes with European funds for agriculture, without considering impacts on the network of local insect pollinators. And this, in his view, could be a problem. Uh, who's keen to respond to that remark? Frank? Yes. Well, actually, I should also say that in some member states and regions, there is already a very clear awareness about this issue. And, uh, and in some cases, a beekeeping is actually banned from Natura 2000 sites for exactly that reason, because there is increasing scientific evidence of a negative impact of, let's say, two massive amounts of honeybees uh, in uh, natural grasslands, for example, competing and uh, with, with uh, let's say, the, the, the wild bees. So, I think there is an increasing awareness of this and there is a changing perception, but it's not as fast as we would like in all member states. Thank you, Frank. Next question uh, is for Angelo from Italy. Um, Paolo says that the loss of biodiversity is also connected with processes and threats that exist outside the Natura 2000 network and how can they manage interventions uh, uh, outside these sites? Well, it, uh, if I can use again uh, the, the very good presentation that Craig did, I think uh, it's, uh, it's really the kind of project that we would like to see. And uh, we have uh, moved uh, away since a number of years now, whether in the, in the strand of biodiversity, like the one uh, that Craig showed in his project, uh, they showed very well the, the case. They were talking about green infrastructure and ecosystem services and things like this, or if you want in a more classical way and uh, under the field of the classic life nature project uh, we do allow uh, any kind of action outside uh, natura 2000 including land purchase provided that you show that this is necessary for the coherence of the network so the work that craig showed uh, where they mapped the the, the pieces of land uh, and the features of the landscape that were needed uh, for the mobility of this uh, uh, invertebrates uh, clearly then tells you where you have to act so, and then uh, within a, even a classical life nature project, you could do this without uh, any problem. The only thing we need is that not only you give us evidence that you need to do that kind of work, but also that by the end of the project, you ensure that that investment that you did and that piece of land is reasonably secured with some sort of either legal or contractual long term uh, system that ensures that the money we've put on that piece of land will remain for long term and perform the same uh, conservation effect uh, that, that you wanted. So you are really most welcome uh, to, to come with a network approach because Natura 2000 is not 28,000 sites. This is an archipelago of islands. We call it network because these islands should be connected and connected means what Craig uh, explained, I think. Thank you, Angelo. Next question is from Andy Plumter. He talks about the 30% uh, nature protection target under the biodiversity strategies and that many bugs and invertebrates are not on, on annex lists of, of species. So he's interested to know if there is an interest to use key biodiversity areas for non-listed species as a mechanism to guide any expansion of conserved or protected areas. Frank? Well, according to the, the new biodiversity strategy, before the end of the year, the Commission will come up with criteria for what it considers as areas to be added to the European network of protected areas, which is not only about Natura 2000. Huh? So the, the question is also what kind of protected areas would count under the 30%. But 
the, I think the most important question is also which areas. And uh, there is a reflection that is ongoing and clearly um, I, I cannot see how the question of key biodiversity areas is not part of that reflection. So I'm quite optimistic that uh, this will be reflected in the final list of criteria. Thank you. Uh, a question from Sara Freitas. Uh, as long as we promote a vision of protected areas versus unprotected areas, it will be difficult to promote sustainable global habitats. Considering that it will be difficult to live without economically exploited areas, it's important to promote cultural practices more favorable to increasing the proportion of biodiversity, especially in vertebrates. But the lack of national information on this proportion and monitoring tables makes it difficult to act and apply in the analysis of investment projects. Who's keen to respond on that? Raise your hand. It's a statement. It's not a question. It's a sta <laughs> no, 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 not me. It's too difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let's move on. Uh, next question is from Gert-Jan van Deune. It's important to take measures for uh, threatened species, but we need to take measures also for not yet threatened species. Um, that might become threatened in the future. Will the LIFE program have enough attention also for this? Manuel, perhaps you can respond. Uh, I will say yes, that the LIFE program is also putting attention of that type of uh, species where we have to make sure that the status of the population are healthy. So the, the, the reply is yes. Okay. Uh, next question is from Bart Bakers. Live biodiversity also gives priority to threatened species not included in the annex, but we have a status in the European Red List. However, some groups of insects like beetles are on national IUCN Red List. Uh, does that mean if they have a threatened status on the national list, but not on the EU list, that they could not be eligible for live funding? Perhaps Angelo? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> the, the unfortunate short reply uh, is that, but maybe Frank. Uh, Angelo, correct me if I'm wrong. I think uh, my understanding is that there is a question on the, the, the co funding rate and uh, a species that is red listed in the European red list might get a higher co funding rate. This is an intention for the next multi annual ah, yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, of course. But uh, we have not clearly excluded uh, a project on a species that is not on the European Red List. It's just that it's obviously not a European priority for financing. But it's not something that for that reason should be automatically yeah, the, 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 the problem to, to correctly reply, if you want, because may, maybe my reply was a bit too draconian, is that we work by using these uh, priorities that we call topics. And these topics, uh, they allow the applicants uh, to raise uh, as much as 10 extra points uh, currently as a bonus. Uh, and obviously this makes a difference between a good proposal that is not financed and a good proposal that is financed. And uh, what what I said, what uh, my negative reply was that if, if a, a species is only in a red list at national level and not at European or at global level in a given category, then they would not benefit of that bonus. It doesn't mean that they are automatically excluded, yeah. Can I add to that? Can I, well, can I ask, ask a question then? If a, if a national red list has um, assessed endemic species, they would huh. effectively be European endemics as well. So would they, uh, could, could they be included? I would expect that then they are automatically also included in the European red list, wouldn't they? Because if they are endangered and they are endemic, uh, that's uh, that's the only population that you have in in the continent, and therefore they should appear all in one and the other, or not? I don't know if that exercise has been done. I think that Craig has a point when uh, we are talking about a species that is from a species group for which there is no EU red list. Ah, yeah, okay. So, and I think we mentioned before some of the groups of aquatic invertebrates, Plecoptera, Ephemeptera, Ephemeptera, Tricoptera, on which unfortunately we don't have European red lists. For yeah, there was a question on that as well, I think. Mm -hmm. 
OK, thank you for clarifying that. So the answer is not as draconian as we initially thought. Uh, next question is from Kathleen Sibel from France. She is curious to understand to what extent some research actions on invertebrates can still be uh, eligible under a life application. Perhaps Manuel, you can respond. It, uh, it they can be eligible. For example, some preparatory action they are eligible, but of course they have they don't have to be really extensive. You cannot spend like in a project of five years, like three years, doing this type of research, basic research uh, action. So it is possible, but limited. And and there is one more feature that they have to secure is that the results of this investigation is needed and will be used for the implementation of the concrete actions during the time of the project. So it's a, it's really concrete action driven that investigation. Yeah. Uh, next question is, I believe, a colleague from Craig from Bug Life, who's asking if there's any way that the UK or UK based organization can still be involved in the life post Brexit period. Angelo? The, the, the first question is why in the world did you leave us? But OK, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> After seeing the results of such a project, I mean, it, it, I, I feel miserable. Uh, I mean, we, uh, I would like you <laughs> to still have tons of these kind of projects. Now, the miserable uh, too. Yeah, the, 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 I think that the, the simple reply is that uh, provided that uh, the, during the, the follow up negotiation, uh, and UK would express the wish uh, to be associated in the next uh, life regulation, uh, then I guess that uh, they, they would be treated like any other country that would like to, to be associated. I don't know personally if there is any particular obstacle in the, in the Brexit agreement uh, to this kind of uh, elements, uh, but uh, if there is none, uh, then uh, UK would, uh, if they are associated to like uh, to to life, then they would participate in full. The only problem we would still have uh, is the usual problem we have with uh, uh, countries that in that moment do not have anymore the application of our EU directives, meaning the Habitats and Birds Directive in their in their territory, and therefore we don't have an official uh, reference for Natura 2000, but I suspect, correct me if I'm wrong, Frank, that this in the case of UK would not that be that difficult because we have had a Natura 2000 network until today. Well, I think it all depends on what the UK will do with its Natura 2000 network after Brexit. Mm -hmm. I am. OK, sorry, something went wrong there technically handing over the mic to uh, Frank. Um, next question is from Santiago Garcia. Um, since we haven't heard from my colleagues yet, I'm going to address the, the question to John, uh, saying that a lot of the insect uh, or invertebrates have an unknown or little studied unknown status because there's not much research information available. So they wa he wonders if instead they could focus uh, a proposal rather on habitat improvements because otherwise it would be really difficult to to make proposals for insects. I believe you have several uh, examples within the live portfolio. John? Yes, um, uh, I think the, the, the Expo studies revealed quite a number. So, for example, the, the work in the Ardennes in Belgium, again, very similar to Craig's study, was a peat, a peat bog restoration project. And they were really, for example, monitoring all the dragonfly species that were coming to that site. And so that was one way to uh, look at the common species along with endangered species and species that were not uh, Annex 2 species at all. So I think some of the monitoring work that done linked to habitats wouldn't logically focus just on one species. You would actually focus on a number of species, butterflies, particularly dragonflies, are easy to monitor in that respect. So in the case studies, we've got some good examples, I think, of that. Yeah. Uh, next question, Frank, I think it's already been addressed, but Christian Kantner for, from Austria wants to know based on which criteria the foreseen 30% protected area will be selected. Well, I cannot anticipate the answer because uh, the criteria have not yet been established and this work will be ongoing in the coming months so that before the end of the year, the Commission intends to come up with criteria. But as I mentioned, Possible criteria might be linked to key biodiversity areas, 
connectivity, robustness of a network. Uh, of course, also when we talk about uh, the 10%, certainly also the, the contribution to climate mitigation and uh, the carbon storage potential, uh, but also uh, certainly, uh, I mean, species related criteria, biological criteria will, will play a, a key role in this. But I can't say more for the moment because this is not yet uh, there is not yet any document re uh, related to that as public. OK, thank you. So without a doubt, we'll hear more uh, later this year. Uh, a question or a suggestion to Angelo from Bernard Thesen is that he suggests an obligatory check of uh, future uh, applicants of their project area for relevant invertebrates and if it's possible to address uh, their needs. Um, if the applicant is not able to, support from the LIFE network should be offered. Angelo, you want to respond or? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice idea. Uh, the only thing is that I personally tend to um, always uh, shy away from uh, additional obligations. Every time you put an obligation in some mechanism, uh, you think you are creating the conditions to solve a problem and then all, all of a sudden re you realize that uh, you, the, the, the system fires back to you. So an invitation obviously to, uh, to, to applicants uh, the, and, uh, and possibly during their project, during their revision phase, uh, uh, we could embed in our system uh, a more explicit sort of push uh, of the applicants uh, to work in that direction. Uh, so that that certainly we we can do, but an obligation. I think we have more than enough under life, and and Craig correctly pointed out the fact that our system is already, uh, administratively speaking, burdensome enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, we haven't heard from my colleague Maria Jose, so I want to share this nice comment. Uh, you say that the LIFE program is not sufficiently attractive for invertebrate specialists, but are invertebrates sufficient attractive for the LIFE program? Maria, what do you think? Yeah, well, I think that the, the, the Commission is now uh, providing more interest to invertebrates. Uh, it, it is being demonstrated they are promoting invertebrates for life, pro for life projects. So I think it's now a good opportunity to present more proposals about invertebrates. Maybe in the next uh, call, uh, the, the call will be better defined for uh, the interest of invertebrates. But I think that it is a good moment for all you if, if you are really want to improve the conservation of invertebrates you have uh, to present proposals, so just do it, please. I can confirm that we are in love with bugs. <laughs> yes, so Angelo confirms we're in love with bugs. <laughs> uh, the next one uh, is a comment. Um, so again, it's uh, concerning wild bees, main taxa involved in pollination, um, and saying that, uh, that a lot of their, again, um, their status is remains unknown so that uh, the European Red List haven't, um, don't have a particular status at the moment. So I think we all agree that more work needs to be, be done there. Um, a question from Marta Kerenstock. How is tackled the beneficiary bug protection in agriculture related to the integral plague control and the directive on sustainable use of pesticides? Very relevant questions, Frank. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I would understand it as uh, what is the relation between life and the mm. uh, the directive uh, 2009 on integral pest control uh, in agricultural lands? Um, well, clearly uh, pest control is uh, an agricultural consideration. It aims at reducing invertebrates and insects or, or other pests on agricultural lands and uh, this is clearly something that would never be covered by a life project um, in terms of uh, the question what we are intend to do I think I can refer back to what I said earlier is that we have in the biodiversity strategy for the first time a quite ambitious target on uh, reducing the impact of pesticides and I think it is in that frame that we should look at uh, how to 
make sure that uh, the impact of pesticides, which we know can be quite substantial for some of them, uh, shall be reduced in the coming years, uh, including on pollinators. Thank you, Frank. Um, next comment is on uh, probl problems for NGOs to actually find co-financing and that they would keen to get access to more national support. <laughs> asking if the EU could do something for this. I think this is difficult to respond. Angelo, you want to say something or? Yeah, it's, uh, the, we, we keep uh, promoting this kind of uh, initiatives uh, by some of the member states uh, where member states either support uh, project preparation or even uh, more ambitiously intervene uh, financially in, uh, in, in the project themselves. Uh, but it's a, it, it looks like a circular economy thing. So uh, the, some countries, they put in place a mechanism like that, lasts uh, three, four, five years, maybe very successfully. Then for political reasons, it disappears. Uh, others put it in place or don't put it in place. Uh, Co-finance projects, then they fall into an economic or financial crisis and then they, uh, they cut short, uh, obviously, that kind of money as well. Uh, so. It's a sort of a continuous uh, fight that, we, that, that I guess we have to accept. It's, uh, it's like that. Uh, on our side, I guess that the two, uh, at least two of the measures that we have put now using, if you want, the crisis uh, induced by the COVID, uh, so the volunteers, and the fact that now we are going to uh, support 100% uh, durable goods in any sort of project and for every sort of beneficiary, uh, the, this is, uh, is a, it's quite a clear way to increase de facto the co-financing uh, uh, compared to the historical uh, rates that we, we have given. So in a, in a project that would involve a significant number of volunteers and that would uh, uh, use a significant amount of infrastructure and durable goods, uh, while before uh, all this either would value zero or would have to be depreciated, now it's not anymore. So, I mean, what we can we do, uh, Frank is uh, actively working on a, on a concept uh, to expand, if you want, uh, the number of species that would profit of the maximum co-financing rate, which is 75%. So this uh, would also help uh, a lot. Uh, we are never going to get to the 100%. This is clear. The, and I don't think it's even wise and healthy. But still, uh, we, are, we are going a bit into, into that direction. And, uh, and I hope that uh, uh, this will be perceived uh, as a positive contribution and we will continue to push member states to do their part as well. Thank you. We're going slightly over time, so we'll address the last two questions. One is from Verle Versteert uh, for Manuel. Can life play a role in the conservation of highly endangered invertebrate species in urbanized area dust outside Natura 2000 sites? They can, they have uh, life, uh, we have life uh, project uh, dealing target, uh, dealing directly with the urban area, so this it will be possible indeed. We have example, yes. Thank you. So the last one is actually more a comment. Pollinators are often put forward, but the effect of pesticides and human waste have a huge impact on the invertebrates that we found in our rivers. Many things could be done in order to restore sufficient quality to our rivers and therefore try to restore ecosystems. Fully agree and I suggest uh, don't hesitate to submit uh, a live uh, application on that. So I'm going to hand back the screen to Frank who will uh, share some concluding uh, remarks before we wrap up today's webinar. Thank you very much, Anne. Well, it's very difficult to summarize what we just discussed. It was extremely rich and diverse and uh, so I can only highlight some key points. Um, maybe just to come back to what Humberto said, uh, there is a momentum for biodiversity conservation now, and we have quite an ambitious uh, EU biodiversity strategy. So I think this is the moment now to look more into uh, these conservation questions. There is also an increased sensitivity for invertebrates. Uh, that is very clear. Uh, and I think the pollinator strategy certainly played a very positive role there. 
there is a willingness from the, our side to look more into the question of funding projects for invertebrates and to make it more attractive to have these projects financed. I would invite you once the next multi-annual work program is out for consultation to have a look. Uh, we are going to send a draft to the member states soon. I'm quite confident that uh, the future multi-annual work program under the new life regulation will indeed be more attractive, also in terms of co-funding rates for uh, the most threatened species, including species that are not listed in the habitats directive. So there is a huge opportunity there. I would also invite you to look again into the, the targets of the biodiversity strategy, and we will certainly make hooks in the application guidelines in the multi-annual work program to the, 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 the targets of a strategy, and that will give you an idea of where the priorities for funding will be. I would also invite you to work with your national authorities uh, on the, the planning of the needs. And I'm talking, I have been mentioning the puffs. Umberto has been mentioning the restoration plans. This is something that doesn't yet exist, but clearly we need information about the financial needs for restoration and management, not only about Natura 2000, about uh, biodiversity conservation and restoration in general. So this will also be a work uh, that will uh, continue in the coming years uh, so that we will not only make use the best possible use of a life program, but also of our EU funds. And I'm in particular thinking about the, the agricultural funds where there is certainly opportunities to do much more in terms of conservation. Of course, we know there is a lot of political pressure on these, but uh, we are also working on this and also the co social and cohesion funds and for the marine areas, the European Marine and Fisheries funds. So I would invite you to consider all these issues. Uh, think about the fact that we are currently in a transition period. Uh, we will have a new multi-annual financial framework with new rules, with new priorities. We will have the biodiversity strategy again with new priorities, but other things will continue and we will adapt the program to these. Uh, so keep that in mind that some of the rules might change after the current call, which is the last one under the, the current life regulation. And I hope this will all go uh, even more for the better and that we are learning and adapting towards new to priorities. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, stay safe. Thank you, Frank. So this concludes our webinar. Uh, Thank you very much to all our speakers, panelists, and especially participants for interacting uh, with us today. And I wish uh, those that will apply under this Live 20 call by mid-July lots of luck in finalizing your application and others to start preparing perhaps for the next round. Uh, you'll see there's some links here that will uh, allow you to download the ex post uh, evaluation on um, that was presented by John and Maria Jose. Um, and there's also a very interesting initiative by the European Commission. It's called the EU Pollinator Information Hive. So those of you working on pollinators, don't forget to, to sign up your actions there uh, so that they get a, an as much as good overview as possible. Uh, we also invite you to sign up for the live uh, newsletter on our website, so then you can stay up to date with uh, more news on future programs. Thanks again to everyone and bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.